Welcome everyone to our annual Supreme Court briefing. Thanks for coming. I'm Irv Gornstein. I'll be the moderator today. Um, I'll give only the briefest of introduction to our panelists because I'm sure you all know them. So we have uh, Paul Clement from Kirkland Nellis, Marty Lederman, who's from Georgetown, Cannon Shamagam from Williams and Connolly, uh, Don Barilli from Munger Tolls, and Helgi Walker from G Gibson Dunn. Um, just a brief word about our format before we get started. One of our panelists will introduce each case. Uh, after the case is introduced, I'll ask other members of the panel to add whatever thoughts they would like to add. Um, and then when that discussion is done, I'll take questions from the press and we'll do it one case at a time. So when the first case is done, we'll move to the second case and repeat. Our first case is Trump versus International Refugee Assistance Project. Marty Lederman will present. Uh, thanks, Irv. I'm going to assume that the press folks here have heard of the travel, so-called travel ban. Uh, really, an entry ban. There's really th there's three provisions of the March executive order there at issue in the case, um, and so I won't go into excruciating detail about how we came to this point or what those provisions do, but just very, very briefly, two of the provisions are in Section 6 of the executive order, and they deal with the refugee program. Um, and one of those provisions, 6A, puts a stop on the refugee program altogether for 120 days as amended by the court's stay in other orders that is, that is applying only to people who don't have a bona fide relationship to persons in the United States. So some refugees, in theory, have been kept out who would otherwise have come into the United States over the course of the summer. And Section 6B lowered the, the annual limit on refugees. These are both worldwide provisions from President Obama's um, 110,000 down to 50,000, so that the most number of refugees that could enter the United States in fiscal year 2000 17 was 50,000. Now that fiscal year ends in 12 days or something like that, and the 120 day ban on refugees ends on October 24th. And the executive order itself requires the, the departments to, to re resume entry of refugees as of that date. So those provisions, I think, are going to be moot. If, if they aren't already, or they will certainly be moot by about two weeks after the court hears oral argument on October 10th. What they will probably be replaced with, and some of you have reported on this, is that by September 30th or October 1st, the president has to set a new ceiling for the next fiscal year, the one that begins October 1st. And he'll probably set a ceiling, and there's been stories about whether it'll be 40,000 or it'll be lower than that or 50,000 or something like that. And that will be the rule going forward with respect to refugees in all likelihood. There will just be a number of refugees over the course of the next 12 months that will be permitted into the United States. The president has an authority to set a ceiling. He will do so. Um, the previous ceiling, the one that was enjoined, was enjoined on the grounds that he didn't have the statutory authority to change Obama's number and didn't have authority to cut off refugees altogether. I suspect that's going to become a non-issue going forward. It's, I mean, maybe others on the panel will disagree. So that leads us to the more notorious or the more famous provision, that's 2C, and that's the one that prohibits the entry into the United States of the nationals of six nations for a period of 90 days. Um, and that provision has been, for, for the most part, stayed, um, but it has excluded certain people without, presumably some number of people over the course of the summer who had no bona fide relationship with the United States have been kept out of the United States who would have otherwise been in the United States. In any event, that provision, by its terms, only lasts 90 days. It began on June 24th or so. So that will expire next week, on the tw I think, or this weekend. On September 24th, the, that ban, to the extent it still exists, will expire by its own terms. Um, is that right? Yes, that, that's right. And it's conceivable, and the ban was put in place, as most of you know, 
during the period in which the principal focus of the executive order, this internal report and review process, was supposed to be undertaken. And apparently it has been undertaken. Reuters has published a cable that was sent out worldwide suggesting that the, that the review started shortly after the Ninth Circuit lifted the injunction on that review. The, the relevant agencies made a report to the president about, the, about inadequacies in um, it, it, the review is for the entire world, not just the Six Nations. The inadequacies, country by country basis, inadequacies in the information that's being provided to the United States for purposes of allowing their nationals to enter the United States. After that, notices went out to the nations of the world um, that we don't know what the, the substance of those notices were, but telling them you need to provide us with X information under X conditions and the like. They were told what the inadequacies were. They're supposed to respond to that. And at the end of the review, the secretaries are supposed to make a recommendation to the president about what the new procedures should be. So that review will be ending very soon as well. And presumably, um, the review will implement new restrictions, conditions on, on some nationals from some nations coming into the United States except under certain conditions. Maybe there will be complete bans on the, with respect to nationals of some nations. There could be some of the six who are already identified. It could be different nations. Could be that there's no bans altogether, but merely conditions placed on it. Could be that we're back to the status quo as it existed before January 20th. We don't know what the results of that would be. So that, that's sort of setting the stage to suggest that this may turn out to be a big dud in terms of the, the, what happens in the court. I think what was really striking, one of the really striking things in the government's opening brief, and I'll, say, and I'll identify several of them, was that the government talked about this re report and review process, but said not a word about where it stood, what was happening with it, or why this case would continue to be alive beyond the date of oral argument, or why it won't be completely overtaken by whatever event, by other events, namely whatever regime the president and the agencies come up with after this review and report are over. I assume that in their reply brief, which is, I believe, to, due to be filed on October 3rd, the Solicitor General will say something about the status of this now completed or almost completed review and report, and the fact that the provisions at issue here in this case have expired or will, are about to expire by their own terms. I think that the, that the landscape will be sufficiently changed that it will require either new lawsuits or at, at most a remand to the district courts in these lawsuits to consider the new rules that will be in place going forward. The old rules will be pretty much ended, the provisions that are at issue here. And I assume, I don't know, but I assume that the new rules will be supported with more of a factual and diplomatic predicate than these were, which was essentially no predicate whatsoever. That there will be a backstory here. We, that we concluded that we had inadequate information from the following countries in the following respects. We asked them to give us further information in the following ways, and we impose these new restrictions for the following reasons because of the you know, X, Y, and Z inadequacies. And then if there are legal challenges to that new regime, they will have to start in the district courts in the first place. So I think that by far the most likely resolution here is no resolution at all, is either the court holds that the case is moot or remands the case for further consideration in light of very different facts and circumstances on the ground come October. It's possible the SG will say, we're almost ready to roll that out, but we're not quite ready. We're still waiting on some information from other countries. And therefore, we extend the, this ban, the 90-day ban, for X number of days, 30 days, 60 days, or something like that. I'm a little skeptical for reasons we can discuss, because it would be hard to do that without at least giving some indication of what they have found in terms of the actual inadequacies from particular countries. They might do that, and that might keep the case alive for whatever short period um, that, that, would, that would extend to. But I think that's possible, but, but less likely. All right. If the court reaches the merits of the case, 
I also think that the big establishment clause question is very unlikely to be resolved by the court. I think it raises very difficult and novel questions about the application of the establishment clause in the area of immigration and overseas with respect to family members of persons who are being allegedly discriminated against because of their religion. I think the much more likely substantive outcome, if it gets to that, will be that the court will resolve the case on statutory grounds. So it's very, very telling, I think, that the court, that the that both at least the Hawaii plaintiffs and the government spend more time in their briefs discussing the statutory question, which was the ground on which the Ninth Circuit invalidated the travel ban, than the constitutional question. And that the SG leads his brief with a very robust argument that none of the plaintiffs here have a cause of action to challenge the statutory basis for the travel ban. It's not, by the way, an argument for the most part that there's no Article III standing on behalf of these plaintiffs. It's more an argument that Congress has precluded lawsuits to challenge this kind of a statutory argument. And that sort of very technical jurisdictional cause of action argument may take up much more of the oral argument time and the, and the court's attention than most people have, have, have so far sort of focused upon. But the SG wants the court to avoid the statutory question because they recognize that they're much more vulnerable on it, not only on the merits, I think, because I think the statutory arguments are rather strong. And just to put it very briefly, the government relies on a um, McCarthy-era statute the, under the McCarran-Walter, provision of the McCarran-Walter Act from 1952, which on, by its terms appears to give the president virtually unbounded discretion to restrict the entry of any persons or classes of persons that if he determines that such entry will be detrimental to the interest of the United States. It's a very broadly written delegation to the president. The Hawaii plaintiffs, the Hogan brief, makes a very, I think, very strong argument that that statute was written against the backdrop of particular constrained and cabined um, historical uh, practices by the president about emergency, um, uh, emergency and emergency events that might occur that make it impossible for Congress to deal with a problem in the first instance. I'm simplifying a little bit here. And almost more importantly, that in the 60 plus years since 1952, Congress has enacted an elaborate, highly reticulated set of restrictions on entry and conditions on entry to deal with most of the problems, including the terrorism problem that the president appears to be um, wanting to deal with here, and that therefore his exercise of this 1952 statute to, to deal with this problem is inconsistent both with the legislative intent in 1952 and what Congress has done subsequently. I think that argument is quite strong, but whether or not you agree with that, this much is true. Since the 1950s, the court has time and again avoided constitutional resolution, has, has punted constitutional challenges to various immigration constraints and instead relied on, statu on, on sometimes quite creative constructions of the authorities that Congress has delegated to the executive branch in the immigration field and decided many cases, starting with Kent versus Dulles, the passport case, coming out of the very same statute as the one here in the 1950s, going up through Sancir and Zavidas, cases that many of you in the audience are aware of. The court regularly over the last 60 years has turned to statutory resolutions rather than reaching big constitutional questions. And I think if it reaches the merits here, it's likely to do that as well, if there are five votes for, for limiting um, the, the president here. Um, I'll say a couple of other things about striking things that are not present in the, in the government's brief and in the government's argument. The first is that many of you may have heard of this concept of the plenary power doctrine. Um, when it comes to immigration. Um, and I, as I teach it, there are two different, vari at least two different variations of the plenary power doctrine. The first, the much stronger doctrine, is that the political branches are entirely free to limit the entry into the United States of foreigners on any grounds that they wish. Substantively, there are no constitutional constraints on what they can do. That, you know, that the Constitution's equal protection norms, establishment clause norms, and the like, free speech norms, do not apply to immigration decisions. Interestingly, not only has the government not made that kind of argument, they conceded in the lower courts that if this were, in fact, a ban based on the religion of 
persons outside the United States, even as a proxy for terrorism, it would be unconstitutional. So the government has basically abandoned them. And I'm not sure the government, you know, I'm not sure how robust this doctrine was, but the government rightly thinks the court is not going to say that the political branches can use religion as a criterion for excluding people from the United States. However, the government is very aggressively invoking what I call the sort of backup plenary power doctrine, and that is whatever the substantive rules might be, whatever the constitutional constraints might be, it is not the place of the courts to second guess the political branches if they say they are doing, imposing immigration restrictions for a legitimate reason the courts should be either deeply reluctant or completely precluded from looking behind that legitimate basis that is asserted and, and, and smoke out illegitimate reasons for, for, for immigration rules. So that's one thing that's interesting. And the other is that the government is, has, given virtual, has pointed to virtually no evidence or no basis, no factual predicate, I shouldn't say no, very, very little factual basis or predicate for these restrictions. It is almost entirely relying on the idea that the court should defer to what it calls the president's judgments when it comes to national security matters because the president says, says that it has predictive judgments when it comes to collecting evidence and drawing factual inferences in the national security context, the courts don't have the competence that the president has. But they point to nothing that the president relied upon, virtually nothing, to impose these bans and in particular no basis for thinking that the very robust constraints and restrictions and procedures and conditions that are currently present that make it very hard to enter the country, particularly protections against terrorists entering the country, are not wholly sufficient to take care of the problems and the risks that the president identified. They've given no ground at all to support what Donald Trump did here. There was no evidence of any problem after 9-11 the only incident they give is of a, someone who came to the United States when he was three, a Somali who came here when he was three years old and later, about 16 years later, was, in, was convicted of a terrorist action. So there was virtually nothing. The whole case is built on this idea that the court should be very wary about even going down this road at all. It should defer to the president even when the president is, as I think everyone could, would concede here, relying on no evidentiary or factual predicate whatsoever for, for his um, determination, um, and a lack of process within the executive branch, right? So the deference rules are typically set up because of a confidence that the court has that the national security establishment within the executive branch and Congress will be adequate and will be making reasoned decisions that will be better judgments than anything the court could do. And here, of course, everyone knows that there was virtually no process whatsoever. Um, the president made this decision effectively on the first day in office. It can only be explained as, the, I, I think, the, the keeping of a campaign promise that he made without consulting with the experts within the executive branch and without those the executive branch officials telling him much of anything about reasons why these new constraints are necessary and why the constraints that were in place before were not wholly adequate. It'll be very interesting to see, I doubt the court will get to this issue, but whether the court is willing to, um, to grant the degree of extreme deference that it usually grants in this area quite reasonably and, and understandably, whether it's willing to do so against the backdrop that we find here, which is of almost no basis for the president's actions. But as I said at the outset, I doubt it will come to that. Thank you, Marty. Um, so I'd like to invite um, other panel members to convey whatever additional thoughts they have and to focus on a couple of questions. Um, one is, do you think, as Marty does, that this case is going to go away, or is there some do you think there's a bigger chance that it'll stay alive than, than maybe Marty does? Um, second, um, do you think the court is um, prepared to actually rule that what if it does get to the merits that the president acted uh, unlawfully? Um, and now Marty says that they would go the statutory route um, rather than the establishment clause route, but do you think if they get to the merits they'll actually um, there'll be five justices who are prepared to say that. And um, third and finally, the court has, um, over the summer, I think, uh, 
at least the, you know, I think it's six justices, um, have attempted to reach a, what I would call a cross-party consensus about what to do over the summer. Um, is there any way to, which I would characterize as sort of splitting the baby. Now you can say, um, you know, maybe they split the baby more in one direction than the other, but um, I think everybody would agree that that was an effort to split the baby by six justices. And is there a way for the court to do a similar thing um, that would be perceived as a splitting of the baby that six justices could join um, here? So those would be the three questions I put on the table for anybody who would like to, to weigh in. I mean, I'd be happy to tackle about one and a half of them, or <laughs> As many as you like. So, um, you know, first of all, I share um, Marty's sense that it's hard to see how the court is going to have much appetite to reach the merits in the context of an avowedly temporary policy. And uh, certainly it has been reported, perhaps some of you have reported, that um, the president is uh, considering implementing a new policy in light of the imminent deadlines to which Marty referred. And if um, the president does so, it's going to be interesting to see how the court manages this litigation. I have to think that if the president promulgates a new policy, there's going to be a pretty strong imperative for supplemental briefing on the impact of that new policy on the pending litigation. And uh, assuming that the court uh, does not reach the merits in that instance where the policy that's under review has effectively uh, expired and therefore been rendered obsolete, I think there are very interesting questions about what the court will actually do with the case, whether the court would uh, vacate the decision below as moot under uh, a Supreme Court lawyer's favorite Supreme Court case, Munsingware, which is the case that governs the circumstances under which uh, decisions are vacated, whether the court would remand or whether um, the court would effectively require new litigation. And I think it's sort of anyone's guess uh, uh, how that would proceed. You know, the only other thing I would observe is to pick up on Irv's point. You know, I think that the court really did exercise an extraordinary degree of superintendence over the nuts and bolts of this litigation in the series of orders that it issued uh, over the summer. I think those orders were in the main, fairly solicitous of the interests of the executive. But at the same time, I think that the court did effectively in its initial order put pressure on the executive indeed to come up with uh, a new policy. And in fact, the very fact that the court set the case for oral argument in October, I think probably uh, placed some additional pressure on the executive to really figure out what it's going to do over the longer term uh, before that oral argument date. And so, you know, I think that that does reflect fairly savvy management on the part of the Supreme Court to try to figure out a way to kind of navigate through uh, uh, this uh, litigation um, uh, in a way that allows the court perhaps ultimately to reach the merits, but not necessarily to do so uh, uh, right now. I think uh, anybody else, and you don't have to limit yourself to my questions, anything else that you want to? Well, just one thing, I, you know, I, I guess I'm in the camp that thinks that there's a high probability that they won't reach the merits because I think there's some there's a real sense of competing pressure here uh, on this case. On the one hand, I think uh, tracing back to the very first executive order, um, pretty strong sense and widely felt sense that that wasn't on the level. You know, it was done in six days with no consultation with anybody in the national security apparatus of any consequence, and the taint of that I think continues in some sense to hang over the whole policy. And, uh, you know, as Marty said, a lot of the reason that courts and the Supreme Court in particular defer to the executive in this area is based on a premise that the executive authority is going to be exercised in a responsible manner. On the other hand, I would find it surprising if the court actually waded into that and issued a ruling that suggested that they were going to calibrate deference to the degree of actual seriousness of consideration and purpose. And so, you know, you, you put those two competing forces side by side, and it seems to me that creates a very powerful incentive to not decide very much at all in this case. Anyone else? So uh, questions from the press on this case? 
It was. So as the court added the question, I, I, I sort of pointed out online that the ban was going to expire at 12.01 a.m. on June 14th, and I think it did. And that afternoon, the president issued a memorandum in which he extended, effectively extended the order for 90 days from the day on which the injunction would be lifted. That's why it ends on September 24th. Um, I think I think the answer to the court's question is, yes, it became moot on the morning of the 14th, but I think it probably was revived on the afternoon of the 14th. Um, the reason I think it will either be moot or overtaken by events is that the predicate for it, this report and, and, and review process, will be completed and we will be either in a new regime or on the verge of a new regime. But, the, but regardless of whether that's happened, by October 24th, by their own terms, these provisions will have expired. They won't be in place anymore, and there's no likelihood that they will be revived. I mean, they might be extended for a short period of time, but I think we're on the verge of a very, as Cannon was suggesting, of something quite different, um, and that quite different thing will, I assume, have a completely different factual, evidentiary, and diplomatic predicate than, than the March order did. If it doesn't, if they provide no, nothing further after all of this, I'll be very, very surprised if they try to extend the ban with no further justification. So um, I, just before I take the next question on, on the mootness question, one thing that's always puzzled me, it's the, the government and says the thing is going to expire exactly when you say it's going to expire. But the executive order actually says it doesn't take effect until it's unstayed. And part of the order is still stayed. So I'm not sure why those parts of the orders aren't still, you know, won't still linger. And if anybody can explain that to me. Maybe, but those presume, but the end of the review process will take the rug out from under the reason for those, for even those unstayed parts. So you'll say, yes, I, you know, that would be, that, that seems right, that once the review process is complete, there's no reason for keeping it into effect, in effect, and so they'll get rid of it maybe, but in, until they do, it seems like it technically is still, that part of the order will still be in effect, even though the government is saying it's not. Next question, yeah. Well, this executive order will be a past event. There will be no reason to enjoin it anymore because it won't be operative any longer. It will be those new restrictions. They might include bans. It might include new conditions. It might. Case, right? I think it's actually a new case, right? I, I but but I'm speculating because I don't know what it's going to look like. But but I think it will be a brand new case with a brand new executive order or a series of new rules that DHS will try to impose. The statutory question will still be present as the president have to the extent there's an exclusion rather than mere new information gathering conditions or something like that. To the extent the president includes wholesale exclusions from X number of con identifiable countries, the nationals of those countries. There will still be, at a minimum, the 1182F statutory question, even if the Establishment Clause question becomes less acute. Or maybe it won't become less acute. Maybe, maybe the new rules will look very much like the March order, but I can't imagine that the government won't be coming forward with a much, what at least purports to be a much richer evidentiary predicate for it. So I would think the most likely outcome is brand new litigation based on a new record. But I, I, don't, I don't want to be very confident of that because I'm speculating about what the facts on the ground will look like. Yeah. Well, I think the strongest part of the Establishment Clause argument actually is in what's not, I mean, it's, it's obviously what's there, is that in the absence of any evidentiary predicate for these rules, 
they can only be explained as the fulfillment of campaign promises. And whether or not the president himself had anti-Muslim animus, he, was, he made a promise to his constituents that he was going to ban Muslims from coming to the United States. And just yesterday, Irv sent me a new statement, or was it a tweet? I don't know, a tweet that he just made saying that if it were up to him, he would go back to his code word, not very veiled, was the, the rules that you know, don't, don't consider political correctness in terms of the travel ban. I imagine there will continue to be an Establishment Clause argument, but that argument will be harder to the extent that there is another explanation that, you know, that seems reasonable and to which the court might defer. Right now, the to my mind, the strongest part of the Establishment Clause argument on the merits is that there is no other, there is no other explanation for what the president did but for his desire to fulfill this campaign promise. Um, presumably, that won't be true with respect to whatever new rules they come up with. But again, I don't put anything past them, so you never know. Yeah. I'm just curious, in the, in the normal course of things, when the administration comes up with uh, a new policy or a new rule that affects the case, would we expect the Solicitor General to suggest to the court that it do something? Uh, we have a couple of former Solicitors General up here who would be better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let them. So I think it, it, the answer is it depends. <laughs> You know, I mean, it depends on what the new thing is and what consequence it'll have, and, um, and you know, we'll see what happens here. But the the administration has has and has had multiple opportunities to take an off ramp if they wanted to, and so far that hasn't happened. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and I would give it the same answer, which is, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. And you know, those of you that are covering the court know that. You know, it's there are a lot of cases where between the time the case gets granted and the time the government goes to the podium, there's been some regulatory clarification or some other development that makes the government's case a little bit easier to defend. I mean, that's you know, that's not limited to this context or national security cases. In most of the cases, that just you know, makes the government's argument at the podium a little better. It doesn't make the case go away. There are some cases where it's sufficiently discreet or sufficiently, um, you know, just sort of distinct. Or, you know, the, both the executive branch and the court um, see a value in taking, you know, some time off um, that, you know, that, that the court, that, that the government could suggest, you know, an outcome that takes the case off the the merits docket, or the court could could seize that. And I think, and, you know, in this context, you know, looking at it, you know, there there seems like you could see why it might be attractive for the court to not decide the case this term. Um, you know, even though, and I, you know, this is the question I was going to ask Marty. I mean, you know, it, do, I mean, do you think the case won't come back? I mean, do, you know, do you really think that? You know, any of the changes will make a material difference to, you know, the district court and the Ninth Circuit. I mean, it strikes me that it's overwhelmingly likely that this case comes back at some point. That some district court somewhere, some court of appeals invalidates whatever they come up with. I, I just think it's too soon to tell. I mean, I just don't know what they're going to, they could come up with something very reasonable. Um, I, I just don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you and Don and others think about, you know, presumably the SG is going to give this, you know, provide this revelation on Tuesday the 3rd, seven days before the oral argument. If it's the sort of thing that really suggests the case should be dropped from that argument calendar, will the court be at all upset that they held this in abeyance until that date, or will that seem quite reasonable? Maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, if, it, I mean, if it's a reason to get rid of the argument, it's a reason to get rid of the so argument. So it seemed to me, um, right from the get, uh beginning, the Solicitor General planned this, and I don't want to attribute too much to the Solicitor or the Acting Solicitor General, but in such a way that one option was going to be that the case would go away, because um, otherwise he could have easily asked for a summer uh, sitting hearing. And by not asking for that, um, 
it seemed to me he was at least opening up the option that it would be in the government's interest at some point to uh, tell the court this is not the case for you to look at anymore. And if there is a case, it will be a case about whatever our new uh, executive order is. Yeah, go. I, I do think that that's one theory, which is that Jeff Wall staged this cleverly so that there would be an exit door. And I actually don't think the court would be that annoyed, Marty, because they themselves may be happy to have the exit, as folks were suggesting. But I just wouldn't count also Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch out of this. They dissented from the stay on the ground that the government had made a strong showing of likelihood of success. And my old boss, Justice Thomas, sometimes says cases aren't moot, even if the government tells him that they are, because he sometimes feels we should just go ahead and decide these questions to Paul's suggestion that these issues are likely to recur and probably not going to wet, go, not, not probably not going to go away. Whether there's some district court judge out there who won't find that anything the administration does, no matter how reasonable it might be, you know, is, I think, a very open question. And these lawyers know exactly, I think, what fora to go to to find a very sympathetic um, district court judge. So even if the court does avoid the merits issues, I can imagine some really interesting writings from that core block of three defending the president's Article II powers. president is not an administrative agency subject to the APA. He doesn't have to compile an evidentiary record for executive actions, particularly under um, a statute that's worded as broadly as the INA is. And that's a view that I think the government is articulating strongly, and one that I can see at least three justices picking up and wanting to write about, even if it's just to provide guidance to lower courts in the event of a remand or possibly some future litigation. Yeah, and I would actually add just one point, which is that I, I think there's a very high likelihood of that. You often see this in the Supreme Court when they punt an issue back to the lower courts where you see justices kind of providing guidance to the lower courts as to how they think those proceedings should come out. And uh, so even if that's the ultimate bottom line outcome, I could see not only those three, but possibly some of the other justices on the other side kind of attempting to <laughs> position subsequent proceedings, knowing that, as uh, uh, others have pointed out, there is almost a certainty that the issue is going to come back to the court sooner or later. I think on this we have a consensus up here that not just with respect to this case, but all of those for the foreseeable future, we will see many more separate opinions from Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch than we do from all of the other justices. So, you know, it seems to me that um, the chief's effort, anyway, will will be to get nine to vacate um, as moot if that option is there, and that way you get both the benefit of the court not doing it, and you wipe out. Um, you, that would be the compromise that you wipe out the lower court decisions as precedent. Um, that would be his goal. Now, I, you can see from last year he had some goals to get nine that ended up with you know six or seven near the end. And, um, you know, once you see Justice Thomas or Gorsuch dropping off, then there will be a temptation from some on the left to also drop off and right. But I do think the chief, the goal would be to get nine for a straight vacate. I, I agree with her, but I don't want to belabor this because I want to get, we should get to Masterpiece. But on this question of whether the lower court just judgments are vacated, there's, for reasons, mostly for reasons expressed in Seth Waxman's brief filed yesterday, I think the right answer would be not to vacate the decisions below, but I, I do want to say that I don't think very much turns on that at all in terms of what would happen in the future litigation. Whether the Ninth and Fourth Circuit opinions are vacated will have virtually no effect on, on what happens in the next round. So why don't we turn to Masterpiece and uh, Don? Okay. So Masterpiece Cake Shop, another case I think that uh, all of you are quite familiar with potentially very significant case posing a conflict between the enforcement of a state law that prohibits discrimination in public accommodations and claims of First Amendment right of conscience. Just a 
quick, quick synopsis of the facts. In 2012, a gay couple, Charlie Craig and David Mullins, they go to the Masterpiece Cake Shop in Lakewood, Colorado. They're going to be married in Massachusetts because in 2012, a same-sex couple cannot lawfully get married in Colorado where they live, but they want to have a celebration of their wedding uh, back in their home state, and they want a wedding cake for the celebration. Masterpiece is a business that advertises to the pub that it serves the public at large and, in fact, does serve the public at large. Uh, its owner, Jack Phillips, is a person of faith, and his faith uh, affects the way he runs his business. Uh, he, should, he believes he shouldn't participate in his business in activity that he believes to be sinful. So he won't make uh, or sell baked goods related to Halloween. He won't affix certain messages or symbols to his baked goods. He won't make a cake with a hateful pro-KKK message on it or with anti-family or anti-religious themes. He also won't make a cake to celebrate a same-sex marriage because he believes such marriages are sinful. So he refused um, Craig and Mullins' request for the cake. Apparently, according to the record, the interaction in the store lasted only about 20 seconds. They went in, they said what they wanted, they were refused, they left. Um, and that leaves a, a lot of particular questions about exactly what Masterpiece Cake Shop and its owner would and wouldn't do uh, unclear, uh, which might matter in the way the First Amendment is applied. So Craig and Mullins uh, go to the press and eventually uh, describe what happened to them. Eventually, another store agrees to provide them a cake for their wedding, I think without charge. They also file a charge of discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation with the Colorado Civil Rights Division. They allege a violation of this ordinance. It is a discriminatory practice for a person directly or indirectly to refuse, withhold from, or deny to an individual or a group because of disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, or ancestry the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of a place of public accommodation. Uh, so the <coughs> Colorado regulatory authorities adjudicate this complaint. Um, the owner uh, of the cake shop, Jack Phillips, makes an argument, uh, First Amendment argument, in his defense in those proceedings, basically saying, for our purposes here, that he has a First Amendment free speech right that is infringed by the enforcement of this statute against him because, um, as his uh, website suggests, each of his cakes is a masterpiece, and they, uh, in general, involve creative effort, and specifically a wedding cake of uh, this kind would involve uh, creative expression, and it would be creative expression compelled in the service of something that he believes to be sinful. He also brought a free exercise claim, freedom of conscience free exercise claim, that this is inconsistent, this being required to make this cake for this celebration would be inconsistent with his religious beliefs. Colorado, the regulatory authorities rejected that argument. The Colorado courts rejected that argument. Uh, Masterpiece sought cert. Case was relisted some enormous number of times, 13, 14 number of Baker's times. Baker's dozen. Right, Baker's dozen. Good. Okay, <laughs> nice, Marty. Well done. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch is confirmed to the court, and short, sometime thereafter, not immediately thereafter, but sometime thereafter, the case is granted. Um, and so you know, this case, I think, poses a lot of potentially really interesting questions. If you want to work through, you could teach most of a First Amendment course, I think, out of this case. So the, you know, one of the really interesting questions here is, to what extent does the freedom of speech guarantee of the First Amendment protect this activity? Um, the, you know, on the one hand, there's a pretty reasonable claim that this is expressive activity. And in fact, there's an amicus brief by uh, Bakers, which has some really good photos in it of, you know, to try to illustrate the expressive character of this activity. Um, but recognizing this as expressive activity that you're going to find First Amendment protection for in this context does raise a question of scope, I think. You know, what about the, the uh, furniture maker or cabinet maker who believes that his or her works are uh, expressive in that sense? And then what about, although I'm not it's not clear to me whether this statute would apply, this reg would apply in these circumstances, but as far as a general principle, what about the medical advice doctors give to their patients? What about the lawyers writing their briefs? I mean, you can, you, you, I think recognizing this 
First Amendment claim is going to raise some significant issues of scope that you, you'd have to wrestle with. Second, um, the First Amendment claim here is largely one of compelled speech, that the baker is saying, look, uh, my, not just my labor, but my expression is being conscripted into the support of an activity that I oppose. And so to what extent is that, do you consider that to be compelled speech under the First Amendment doctrine? To the extent it's, you know, an argument that, well, I've got a, uh, you know, that, that I'm being required to sell cakes that I, to couples that I don't want to sell cakes to, um, that feels less like a compelled speech argument because the, the argument there is, well, my cake is going to be at this celebration and that will send a message of my endorsement of this celebration when in fact I don't endorse it. I believe it's wrong as a matter of my faith. Um, and the reason I think that's not the strongest claim in the world is because the, it's not a situation I think in which the audience would would understand the presence of the cake at the at the ceremony at the reception as being indicative of the maker of the cake trying to send the message or being affiliated with the message. I think probably nobody who goes to the reception has any idea who made the cake or is particularly interested in it. Um, but um, there are a couple. Of, but but that's not the end of the story. I think in thinking about this First Amendment compelled speech question because. What, uh, what he's saying here is, well, actually, it's much more than that. You know, I, every cake is a masterpiece. I have to come up with a conception for the cake and execute and execute it using artistic endeavor. And so it's more of a First Amendment right of conscience kind of compelled speech than a the public's going to view this message, uh, it's going to associate me with a message I don't want to be associated with kind of compelled speech. Um, and that, you know, they, they, um, the, the the cake shop cites famous West Virginia against Barnett case, the case the state statute that forced school children to say the Pledge of Allegiance, which was struck down as a First Amendment violation, and saying this is really parallel to that. I'm being forced to speak in a manner that violates my faith. Um, so then, you know, another sort of set of questions that comes out of this seems to me is how how how's the court going to approach the free speech question? Um, as a matter of First Amendment doctrine? Are they going to think about this as a case in which what we're talking about here is the application of a content neutral law that's not subject to exacting First Amendment scrutiny because it seeks to achieve an end unrelated to the freedom of expression and the activity that draws the legal remedy isn't one that um, uh, isn't based on the content of the expression or any uh, any views about the content of, of the expression, in which case the state law would have more latitude. And this is the so-called O'Brien test under First Amendment law, in which um, states get regulators get sig fairly significant latitude, um, so long as their law is in fact neutral and is being applied for neutral reasons, and isn't substantially overbroad in relation to the purposes for which it's being enforced. Uh, on, on theory, at least under that doctrine, it'll be upheld. But the question will be whether that doctrine really applies in a circumstance like this. I think that's a significant question. And then what about the free exercise claim? You, you know, the parties have focused a good deal of their attention on the freedom of speech claim. And to the extent the court vindicates uh, the, the cake shop's freedom of speech claim, it wouldn't be required to reach uh, the free exercise claim. Typically, under existing law, under the free exercise clause, if a law is facially neutral and isn't being enforced in a, a discriminatory manner with respect to religious exercise, it doesn't violate uh, the First Amendment. But you know, will, that, will the court adhere to that standard here? Will they find this to be discriminatory enforcement in a manner that uh, implicates the free exercise clause? Um, just a couple of more points. Uh, the, really interesting development. Recently, the United States filed a brief in support of the cake shop, did so limited to the First Amendment free speech claim, didn't address the free exercise claim, essentially made an argument that there is a cognizable First Amendment free speech uh, interest here. It's rooted in freedom of conscience. Uh, 
and it's sufficiently weighty that it should override the enforcement of the law with respect to a claim of discrimination based uh, on sexual orientation. The last couple of pages of the brief get at what I think is you know, a, a really interesting feature of this case. The last couple of pages of the brief for the United States say, but if this had been discrimination based on race, for example, had it been the assertion of a faith-based objection to interracial marriage, that the country's history of race uh, and the constitutional doctrine recognizing that laws that, that discriminate on the basis of race um, raise are, are presumptively invalid and raise very, very serious issues and problems, lead one to the conclusion that the government's interest in preventing race discrimination is sufficiently strong that it would overcome the First Amendment interest here, even though uh, it would not be the government's interest as articulated by Colorado in prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation wouldn't be sufficiently strong. And I think that's sort of the, the interesting feature of this case that, that you know, there is, I think there certainly is a strong right of conscience claim being made here, being expressed in a, in a, in a and, and I think it, it, the argument is that uh, it's not just a right of conscience, but it's a right of conscience tied to me being forced to engage in uh, expressive activity. And the parties, the cake shop and the United States have tried to craft an argument that allows the court to say, well, this will just be a narrow exception, the First Amendment exception to the enforcement of the civil rights laws. But I wonder about that. Um, you know, maybe on the facts of the case as a practical matter. And then there's another fact that's significant in the case too, which is in 2012 at the time um, that these events took place, same-sex couples I mentioned couldn't get married in Colorado. And so maybe that dilutes the strength of the state's interest in this particular case. But the rule that uh, is actually being contested in this case is one that I think will require then the court going forward, if not in this case, perhaps in this case itself, but certainly going forward to then answer some very hard questions such as, um, well, if this First Amendment right of free speech is sufficiently strong that it overrides state regulatory efforts to prohibit, prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, what about free exercise claims? And what about freedom of association, First Amendment freedom of association claims? You know, what, why, what, what, what is it about the First Amendment that allows you to rank those and give one priority and not the others? And of course, all that does resonate with our history in that uh, when the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s were enacted, there were quite substantial objections made in litigation over whether the individuals who did not want to abide by those laws, the public accommodations laws and Title VII, could assert uh, free exercise constitutional claims, could assert freedom of association constitutional claims. I'm not sure whether there were a lot of free speech claims, but those other kinds of First Amendment claims were asserted as justifications for not having to respect laws that were enacted to try to root out, principally root out race discrimination. And of course, you, if you remember the whole uh, Bork hearing situation, one of the things that was a significant topic of Judge Bork's uh, confirmation hearing, and that led to some senators at least voting against him, was that he had written an article in the New Republic in which he made that very argument about freedom of association, at least, against the enforcement of the civil rights laws in 1964. He then backed off of that in his book, uh, Tempting of America, making an argument that there's really no principled way to decide among th these competing values of importance, and therefore courts shouldn't do so, um, which you know may have you know, may have some bearing on the way the court ought to think about this case uh, as it considers it this fall. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, one thing I want to start with is um, just the, the, the challenge that you laid out is to, for the court to find some way to rule for um, this particular plaintiff without opening the door wide open in a way that I think, you know, most of the court would feel pretty uncomfortable with. And so there's some very broad arguments out there um, but it seems to me that the government's brief is an effort to uh, cabin this principle um, to speech on the front end and speech on the back end. Um, and so 
they would say um, speech on the front end, I think, is not enough. That is, that somebody's involved in an artistic endeavor is not enough. Um, because then anybody who's uh, involved in art, an artistic endeavor presumably couldn't be compelled ever, um, absent a compelling interest to uh, produce anything that's artistic. And then speech on the back end is, is pretty, by itself, um, also pretty expansive, uh, because then you have anybody who is participating in any way in facilitating this wedding um, would have a claim, um, which the government says they don't. And so the question is, is the principle ad adequately cabined when you require both artistic or endeavor on the front end and, um, as the government says, figurative or literal participation in speech on the back end, i.e. the wedding celebration? And so that's one question I would throw out, is whether that um, you think that's a principle that the court can live with, uh, or if not, um, is there some other principle, maybe a broader one, that they're willing to apply? And um, anything else that anybody else wants to comment on? I will say I think it's deeply unlikely that five justices would hold that Colorado doesn't have it. It's interesting that the government and the bake shop have both said that the, the answer here is to apply some sort of strict scrutiny where you need a compelling governmental interest and the like. That isn't usually the way compelled speech cases are resolved. Once there's compelled speech, it's invalid in most of the, in Barnett and other cases. We don't ask about this government's interest. The SG has come up with this and tried to put it in this framework precisely so he can get up at oral argument, quite understandably, and say, race would be different. There would be a compelling interest there. There's not a compelling interest here. That's great from his perspective. I can't imagine Justice Kennedy writing an opinion saying, A, that we apply some sort of strict scrutiny test, and B, protection of discrimination against, against sexual orientation uh, discrimination is not a compelling interest. So I don't think that's a solution for the court. Um, and so although I think there might be five justices sympathetic to finding some way to rule for the bakery on narrow grounds, I don't think that's it. And I think it's very, very difficult, we've been sort of scratching our heads, to come up with limiting principles that would cabin the case to not open up the door very wide for things that the court would be very concerned about. I'm not putting it past them because they're very good lawyers, as you all know, and very good creative justices. But it's really, really hard to um, to find a way there, just as a doctrinal matter. I think that's true under the free speech branch of the First Amendment, and I don't. I think the government has signaled it doesn't want to go the free exercise clause route. But Colorado has conceded that it applies this law in a one-way direction. Colorado allows artists who support same-sex marriage to refuse request to oppose it. And the um, petitioner's brief includes some other examples of kind of the, the one way discriminatory, they say, application of this statute to force people to speak on certain topics, but allow people to have the opposite view and to refrain from speech on a purely content-based, indeed viewpoint-based basis. So I think that on that record, that could be a narrow way out of this. We don't have to address the larger question of when non-discriminating public accommodations laws run into the compelled speech doctrine. It's clear, at least under the free exercise clause, that you cannot apply these statutes facially neutral in a discriminatory way. And on the facts of this particular case, Colorado is, is not applying the statute in an even-handed way. So that, that seems like an intriguing idea to me, but for the fact that it's got waiting in the wings, you know, 17 other cases just like this one that may not have that feature. And so I would also I just, say I, I just think, wonder whether that's a way out of, of things for them. Well, it's a way out of this case. It's a way out of this case, but if you think... I mean, I suppose they could just keep denying cert unless a situation like this arises. I mean, that would be one possibility. They have denied cert 
previously on this question, at least what once or twice, um, the, the broader question. Yeah, I mean, that, is, that question. issue's in there. Um, and, but, and, but I think the fact that the parties in the United States have, have not fronted it actually reflects a judgment that, you know, and Helgi may be right about this, but I guess my, my sense of it is a little different. My sense of it is that the concern there would be, just picking up on what Irv said, that whatever you're going to do with your own decision making, if you're thinking about this as a managerial matter and, and what kinds of obligations you're then going to impose on the lower courts, the opening up the free exercise avenue um, could, be, could be a lot more destabilizing than, than recognizing this kind of a free speech claim. I also, I mean, I think it's fair to predict or safe to predict that the bottom side briefs will demonstrate that Colorado is actually not applying its laws at all uh, in a discriminatory manner. The examples that Helgi refers to are cases in which the Colorado discriminate, no customer is being discriminated against on the basis of any of the protected categories under the Colorado law. It's simply, it's, n it's not as though they grant exemptions for those cases. Those cases simply don't violate the Colorado law in the first place. And so I think it's a stretch. I do think that we will see a separate opinion from Justices Thomas Gorsuch and Alito on free exercise values. And in fact, I think the, the religion will play a role, a supporting role in any opinion that the court writes. But I, like Don, I think that um, both, both the bake shop and um, the SG's judgment is correct that the, the much more likely avenue of victory is through the compelled speech claim rather than the free exercise claim. Press. Yeah. Anybody who has any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, you know, one possibility is just to rule out a claim like this um, that, that rule it out. You just say, I mean, the general principle on um, non-discrimination law is that if the government is prohibiting conduct, which it's doing in this case, and incidentally affecting speech, which is what's happening, the normal rule is there's no First Amendment right, period. Now there's an exception to that. That's been articulated, as the government said, in the Hurley case. Um, and so 
to, to, to the easiest route for the court, um, if it wants to rule the other way, it seems to me, is to go get as close to Hurley as you can and say this is just like Hurley, or as the government says, sometimes it seems like it's saying, and by the way, the Hurley case is the parade where um, the state said you're discriminating when you don't allow um, gays and lesbians to march in your parade. And the Supreme Court said, there's a normal rule. Our normal rule is that when you have a conduct-based prohibition, which this was, prohibits discrimination, our normal rule is that's not a First Amendment problem. But here, something different is going on because the parade organizers are themselves engaged in speech and because forcing them to accept a con contrary message, would one that's contrary to their views, would alter their own speech. And so if the court is going to rule in, the, I think, the narrowest possible way, it would follow for the plaintiffs, it would follow that Hurley model, which is you know, what the government has set out in its brief. And I, I'd add a footnote to that. If you wanted to narrow it further, if you're going to take that route and narrow it further, I think you might focus on the fact that this occurred in 2012 when Colorado didn't recognize uh, same-sex marriages and it wasn't in the Constitution. And one could say that you know, given that set of circumstances, uh, which now is a, you know, applies only historically, um, it's difficult to say that Colorado had a sufficiently strong interest uh, to overcome the assertion of the First Amendment right. And we're not saying anything about how that calculation would occur in a, in a different context in which you, know, you now have Obergefell on the books. I mean, I think that's a way to narrow the thing. But I think that would be, and I don't think you're saying anything different. I mean, tell me if you, but that would be a constructive dig. Yes, that's correct. I mean, that that's that correct. would be, that's you know, correct. well, yeah. Yeah. That, we, we yeah. thought we should take this case, but now we, or, or four of us thought we should yeah. take this yes. case, but now five of us don't. Right. Yeah, but that, yeah, that happens I, sometimes. You know, oh, it, it does. So, no, I just, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. thought it was helpful to describe that. Yes, um, I, as, think, as I think that's right. So uh, four, okay, I mean, this was a grant of four who were, you know, which suggests that four are prepared. Um, you know, it always suggests to me when you get a grant like this that, that, that four are prepared to reverse and they expect to find a fifth. But it doesn't always work out um, that you get the fifth. And the fifth may get, um, you know, look for some way out, and that would be a way out. <laughs> yeah, though, what I think makes it interesting, though, is that, you know, I think there really are probably only two suspects for the fourth vote, and they're either Justice Kennedy, and, you know, he could, the case could look different to him after all the briefs are in than it did at the cert stage, um, or it's the chief, and... You know, I mean, you know, it just, it, it strikes me as a little bit odd that the chief would want to sort of take this up, uh, you know, only to end up with a constructive dig. So I, you know, I just think if you think about who that fourth vote is, it makes, you know, the nuance, you know, even So, so even I've more been assuming the fourth vote is Kennedy. Yeah, okay, but, but then, you know, then, then I think you would, to get to the constructive dig, you'd have to have the case look different at the point that the, all the briefs are in than it did at the point where all the, you know, the cert petition briefing's in. Yeah. You know, the one, the one other thing I would say to, to kind of Nina's question is, you know, I, in sort of thinking about this case, you know, it, it sort of brings, you know, I, I think maybe one sort of relatively narrow way to decide this case is, you know, the, the Supreme Court, you know, must be 10 years ago, had the case involving Casey Martin about the nature of golf. Um, and I think this case may end up being on the nature of cake baking. I, I, I mean, you know, I really, I, I really do. I mean, which is to say, you know, if you, if you conceptualize a bakery as, you know, a quasi common carrier, you know, then I think the case comes out one way. I think if you, you know, conceptualize cake baking as, you know, the functional equivalent of somebody engaged in expressive dance at the wedding, um, you know, the case comes out the other way. And so I, I, I ultimately am not sure that the court's, you know, not going to decide this case principally about the nature of cake baking in a way that may suggest how some of the other cases waiting in the wings get decided. 
Right. Interesting. Um, one other thought I had about a narrower decision, um, which is one thing that's su suggested to me, why didn't they take the photography case? Why are they taking the cake case? Um, the injunction in this case, e even though we don't know what the facts are uh, about why they refused to do what they did, but the injunction literally in this case prohibits them from treating same-sex couples any differently than um, traditional um, opposite-sex couples. And so if, if a opposite-sex couple wanted a cake that said, God bless this union, um, then a uh, same-sex couple would also be entitled to that cake under the injunction, at least as I read it. And you could see a narrow decision saying that insofar as the Colorado statute requires that, um, that is actually um, inscribing words contrary to belief, that it might pose a problem. I, I think Irv's point is worth stressing, which is we're all rightly taken with the events that happened here with with the couple in particular, but their case is to a certain extent moot. They're not even seeking, they weren't even seeking damages. What's really at issue is this injunction that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission and courts have entered, which is forward looking and requires equality of treatment as between different sorts of marriage couples. And that's why I think the dig route may, may be difficult to get to. Um, and and maybe the court will. I think there will. Be, I think there will actually be nine votes for saying that the customized cake making is entitled to some First Amendment protection. That artistic activity like that is not wholly outside the First Amendment. But that's quite a far away from saying that they win the case here um, because of the O'Brien sort of an, of analysis. So I actually think on that there will be a consensus on the court. Um, but going further, I think, is difficult because of this injunction. Now, Irv's right. Maybe they'll draw a line between express you know, words or figurines. You know, can't compel that, but could compel the cake standing alone doesn't say anything um, until the parties themselves, the couple, if they want to give it some meaning at the ceremony, but that's far removed from the baker. The cake at my wedding didn't say anything except implicitly what the cake in Alice in Wonderland said, which was, eat me, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, it sure didn't say anything about us. And, um, and I, that's the hardest part of the case, I think, for the bakery, is this is not the, what Irv calls the front end, is not convincing the justices that he's involved in artistic activity protected by the First Amendment. I think they'll all agree on that. It's that the, the, what Irv rightly says is the, the second condition, which is that my product itself will speak. It will say, celebrate this couple. And if it does, that injures me in some First Amendment way. That's a harder sell. But that, I think that's where the, the nub of the case. Any other questions from the press? All right, then let's move on to Gil against Whitford and Paul. Sure. And... Uh... I'm sensitive that we have uh, quite a few other cases to cover, so I'll try to uh, pick up the pace here a little bit. And this case is really easy to describe. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's either impossible to describe or it's super easy, so I'll go the super easy route. Um, and, you know, I filed an amicus brief for some, the, the Wisconsin uh, Assembly and the Wisconsin Senate. Um, so just with that sort of caveat of disclosure, um, take this with a grain of salt. But the, you know, this case is obviously, uh, you know, a case that's being closely watched uh, by the people up here, if not, uh, you know, Nina's uh, broader uh, listenership um, as a case involving about whether the court is essentially going to come up with a standard to adjudicate partisan gerrymandering cases or whether they will continue to treat partisan gerrymandering cases, unlike racial gerrymandering cases, as non-justiciable. And just to sort of set the backdrop for this, you know, part of the reason, there are lots of reasons why this is interesting, but at least one of them is, I think all nine members of the court at one point or another have, you know, expressed in opinions or joined opinions recognizing that, you know, at least in certain parts of the country, uh, there's a strong correlation between race and politics, partisan politics. And so there is a little bit of an oddity of a system where a state legislature can 
um, come into court and essentially defend against a racial gerrymandering claim by saying, oh, don't worry about it. Um, we weren't discriminating on the basis of race. We were just trying to, you know, help the Democrats or help the Republicans and the like. So there is kind of that sort of, if you will, kind of, you know, you know, instability in the law that you have prohibitions on racial gerrymandering, but not on partisan gerrymandering. At the same time, you know, the court has tried its hand at formulating a test for these claims that they could get, that five justices could get comfortable with. Uh, you know, it seems, you know, every, every, every 10 years there's a census, about every 10 years the court takes a look at partisan gerrymandering to try to figure out whether there is uh, a justiciable test. And the question in this case, I think, you know, broadly put, is whether uh, the, the court, and more particularly Justice Kennedy, uh, who the last time around uh, had an opinion that sort of expressed kind of, a, you know, a, a middle ground of not having found the test yet, but not wanting to foreclose the possibility that the test is out there, um, you know, whether, whether they are now going to be five justices to have a test for partisan gerrymandering claims. Uh, the case arises out of uh, my home state of Wisconsin. Um, it arises out of really the first time in three decades that the political branches in Wisconsin could functionally engage in redistricting. So, you know, redistricting is both mandatory every, every decade because of the one person, one vote requirement. So, you know, all these cases are frustrating. The legislatures get sued all the time. You know, you'd, you'd think one option is just leave the stupid maps alone, um, but that's not an option. You know, the one person, one vote, and the fact that people don't stay put for 10 years um, combine to force states to essentially redistrict. And if they can't put a politically accountable map in place, uh, they'll get sued for violation of one person, one vote, and essentially have a judicial map imposed upon them. Um, you know, it can be exceedingly difficult for the political branches to come up with maps that make it through the process because you basically have to have, as a practical matter, uh, you know, both houses of the state legislature in one party's hands and the governor's office in the same party's hands. And in a relatively purple state like Wisconsin, that doesn't happen every time, you know, every, every, every time. So last two cycles, um, and, it, and in something like four of the last five cycles, uh, you know, the, 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 the elections took place under what was a, ultimately a court-written map, not a politically, a, a politically written map. This time around, you had the Republicans in control of the state Senate, the state assembly, and the governor's mansion, and so they got their, their map actually through. Um, it was initially challenged on some other grounds, including Voting Rights Act and the like. It, you know, with the exception of one district around Milwaukee, it survived those challenges. It went into effect uh, for a couple of elections, um, and the Republicans did pretty well in those elections, which I suppose is not a shock, uh, given that it was, you know, written by a state legislature controlled by the Republicans with a Republican governor. Um, and it's the very fact that the Republicans did well in the first couple of cycles that was used as the basis for a challenge to the map um, on the basis that it was a partisan gerrymander, that it was effectively kind of too favorable to the Republicans, either entrenched them or essentially skewed too far in their favor. Um, the court, when the case was first brought before a three-judge district court, there was a lot of focus, almost exclusive focus, I think when it was very first brought, the other side might quibble with this a bit, but I think when it was first brought, there was a lot of focus on the so-called efficiency gap. And the efficiency gap is this notion that you can look at votes that were cast uh, by uh, the minority party, um, which could be obviously very different in one state versus another, uh, but you look at the votes that were cast by the minority party, and those votes that were, were cast in very safe districts, above 50%, are essentially wasted votes. And the votes that were cast in uh, essentially Republican districts, um, where the Republican wins, those Democratic votes are also counted as wasted votes. And you sort of calculate up all the sort of wasted votes, and you figure out, sort of comparing the Republicans and the Democrats, how skewed is this in favor of the majority party? And for reasons you know, that are explained in a Law Review article somewhere, you know, people came up with the idea that about 7% um, is the point, the efficiency gap, where you get into sort of at least yellow flag territory. Now, one problem with the efficiency gap 
is that, you know, it's really not at least, you know, and again, take this with a grain of salt, but I don't think the efficiency gap is really kind of neutral because it's just an observed fact. And, you know, anybody that wants to look at the, you know, map of the last presidential election where, you know, uh, you know I think uh, Secretary of State Clinton, you know, only carried like what, like 60 counties or something like that. I don't have the exact number, but, you know, it's just there, it is it is a political fact that Democratic voters tend to be relatively concentrated um, in urban areas and that Republican voters are relatively dispersed in rural areas. So even if you did a map dr drawn up by a sort of set of like nonpartisan commission, uh, like despite my best efforts they have in Arizona, uh, you're going to end up with a, a efficiency gap, um, you know, a, a, a non-zero efficiency gap. And some evidence of that is, as I mentioned, the past election map for the last decennial cycle was written by a court as part of a judicial remedy, and it had an efficiency gap in Wisconsin of over 7%. Um, so, you know, so in part, perhaps because of some of those problems with the efficiency gap being sort of a standalone test, the three-judge court, or two judges of the three-judge court, came up with a standard for part partisan gerrymandering that is essentially a three-factor test. Uh, it starts with sort of partisan intent, uh, an intent to either entrench the partisan majority or to sort of unduly benefit the partisan majority. It then has an effects test, um, which, you know, is, is a multi-factor test that looks at, considers the efficiency gap, but also considers other kind of statistical analysis to try to figure out whether there was a sort of undue partisan effect. And then the third factor is justification or whether essentially the effect that observed is really kind of necessarily explained by the political geography of the state. Um, and applying that three-pronged three test, the court found that the Legislative Plan Act 43 uh, sort of flunked the test. Now, I think as a practical matter, um, you know, all of the work on that test is largely going to be done by the effects part of the test because, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that if the majority party doesn't have some intent to favor the majority party in redistricting, um, you know, they'll probably have like a malpractice suit brought against them or something. So you can almost, I, I don't think satisfying the intent part of the test is going to be difficult. And then the justification test, I think, you know, is also probably not going to do a lot of work if it really is kind of a necessity test or, you know, real sort of, uh, sort of almost like strict scrutiny type test. So I think a lot of the work will be done on the effects test. And I think figuring out whether there really is a workable test for uh, discriminatory effects on the basis of partisan identity is really the hard question that I think will probably be the focus of a lot of the questions uh, in the, at the court. The, the last couple of things I'll say about this is, you know, in this area, because of the Veith case and the fact that, you know, everybody sort of looks at the, you know, sort of the goal here, if you're a challenger, to articulate a justiciable test uh, or a test that Justice Kennedy will think is justiciable, um, because that's the mission here, you know, there's this weird almost disconnect between the sort of the test and the arguments of the party about justiciability and the underlying constitutional theory. And it, you know, so, sometimes it can get lost, and, and, and I wonder whether at least some of the justices won't press at the argument about, oh, okay, like even if we could have a test to identify it, like, what ex like how exactly does it violate the Equal Protection Clause to engage in undue partisan gerrymandering? Um, and, you know, or as Justice Kennedy suggested um, last time around, you know, is this really more of a First Amendment claim um, that that's the nature of the problem and it's not really the Equal Protection Clause that's doing most of the work here? You know, one of the things I think is kind of interesting about this kind of three-pronged test that has been, you know, sort of suggested is, you know, I wonder if you applied that test to non-redistricting legislation. Um, you know, how much legislation you might strike down. I mean, because it seems to me, you know, maybe I've just been here too long and I've grown cynical, but it seems to me that a lot of legislation gets passed for partisan advantage that has a decidedly partisan, you know, advantage or impacts 
the voters of the Republicans or the Democrats that are in charge in a way that favors them and as to justification, oh, there's almost certainly a better way to do this, but we're going to either benefit the unions in this way or we're going to harm the unions in this way or we're going to cut taxes this way or we're going to raise taxes in this way. So, so, so I think you know, there must be something for the argument to work. There must be something that's very distinct about the redistricting process. And I, I, I'm, I'm certain, you know, Paul Smith's a great lawyer. He's going to be ready with answers for this. But I do think that's something that in the briefing, with all the obsession about the standard, um, that gets a little bit lost in the, in the shuffle a little bit. And it's related to the other thing that's going around, uh, 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 sort of uh, around in this case that's kind of lurking is a standing question. Um, the Supreme Court in the race districting, uh, the racial redistricting context has been quite clear recently that you really have to bring a claim that's not a statewide claim, but is a district specific claim. And so I think in the race districting context, the understanding of the constitutional injury is that you, you as a voter have been put in one district rather than another on the basis of your race. And yet in the partisan gerrymandering context, this challenge and to be fair, almost all of the challenges are brought on a statewide basis. And the lead plaintiff, for example, in uh, this case is a voter in Madison. Um, I assure you that there is no way to draw a district in Madison, Wisconsin that does not produce a Democratic victor. So it's not like that person is suffering the same kind of injury that the, the, that the plaintiff is suffering in the race redistricting context. And so there's a lot of this discussion about standing, but I think ultimately that is a discussion about what is the nature of the constitutional injury here. And to me, frankly, it's a little bit easier to understand why you can bring a statewide case if it's a First Amendment injury than if it's an Equal Protection Clause injury. Uh, so again, I think there's a lot, just because of the way this case has been briefed and all the focus on whether these are justiciable, I, you know, I think there's a lot of this iceberg that's sort of you know, below the surface, and I think some of that will probably be explored at the argument. Thanks, Paul. Anybody else uh, have, want to add thoughts on partisan gerrymandering? I mean, I would just make a couple of quick observations. I mean, the first picking up on Paul's point is that it's hard to see how, in framing the 14th Amendment, the uh, founding fathers or their reconstructor, re reconstruction era successors were uh, concerned about the efficiency gap. I mean, I think there is a real disconnect between these almost legislative proposed constitutional standards and the constitutional prohibition itself. But even if you disagree with that, I think that the court is going to, I think, be quite concerned about the prospect of unleashing district courts around the country to apply whatever standard it comes up with, knowing that because of the variation in uh, uh, district judges, and of course they will typically sit in three judge panels, but the variation of, of approach in judges around the country, any standard that recognizes this type of claim is inevitably going to require a fair amount of subsequent superintendence by the Supreme Court. I mean, if there's one thing we've learned from redistricting jurisprudence generally, it's that the Supreme Court has had to uh, engage in a great deal of that supervision, and I think it's an open question whether the court's going to want to do that in this context, context as well. The only other thing I would say is that I think there'll be some concern as well about, you know, kind of the inevitable politicization of the judiciary that's going to result from recognizing these sorts of claims. The so-called political question doctrine has become relatively dormant, at least on the Supreme Court level, in recent years, but I do think that there will be, uh, you know, a concern that embroiling the courts in these quintessentially political disputes is going to be problematic. Um, and while uh, there's no doubt that um, political gerrymandering is engaged in with a greater degree of mathematical precision these days, I think that those concerns about the impact on the judiciary are going to weigh pretty heavily in the court's mind. Anyone else who wants to weigh in on this one? Um, I was just going to say that when I was reading the briefs to Paul and Cannon's point, I kept thinking of Eddie Haskell, the gee whiz, Mrs. Cleaver. I had no idea there was self-dealing going on in state legislatures. I mean, I think the court is going to have a little bit that kind of reaction. This has been going on since we've had elections in America. So I think there are going to be serious questions about 
why, what does it even mean to talk about discrimination on the basis of political party affiliation in the electoral context? I'd like to push back a little bit on that idea just because I think Justice Kennedy, if you read his opinions in Vieth and Lulak and other cases, he actually does think this is constitutionally problematic and there's a good reason for it and there's a good reason he cites the First Amendment cases. In virtually every other doctrinal area from First Amendment to ballot, the messages on ballots and the like, access to auditory and the like, the court has said in a, in a bunch of different contexts, of course it is constitutionally impermissible for the state, for the government to structure the law and certainly the election law, to try to favor one partisan political party. That's just an illegitimate governmental objective. And yet Helgi's obviously absolutely right. It's been going on since the dawn of time. Justice Kennedy thinks this is very problematic from a constitutional perspective. He doesn't think that's the way it ought to be. And it's not clear, it's not clear to him why in this context alone that ought to be a legitimate reason for, for using the power of the state to, to to shape how things are going. But I agree with my fellow panelists that he's going to be probably very uncomfortable with, with any of the tests that have been proposed to him. And this is really the odd political question context. In most other political question doctrine contexts, the resolution by the court is, well, this is OK, because the Constitution has assigned some other party, the president, the Congress, the Senate, when it comes to a trial. The responsibility not only to do the action in question, but to decide what's constitutional and what's not. There's no pretense of that here. No one's saying it's up to the state legislatures to decide what's constitutional and not. Everyone agrees that they aren't, they don't care about any constitutional constraints here. And so what Kennedy is worried about is that he thinks that there is widespread constitutional violations that have been going on since the dawn of the Republic. And a ruling that the courts are going to be out of it means no one will be remedying this problem. And so the question I have, and I'm glad Paul raised the Arizona case, which most of you are probably familiar with from a couple terms ago, the 5-4 decision that allowed the, the, the people of Arizona to determine that a neutral independent commission should draw the lines rather than the Arizona legislature. I think Kennedy thinks that's the solution. And I wonder whether Paul's loss in that case actually will benefit his clients in this case, in that Kennedy might be given some comfort that that's the wave of the future. Now, it's going to be much easier to get there in, the in I, I don't know how many, 11 states or so that have initiative processes rather than expecting state legislatures and governors to impose these sorts of neutral, the expert, let the experts draw the maps rather than the politicians. But I think that He's enamored of that solution. That's why he's in the, one of the main reasons he was in the majority in the Arizona case. And if he thinks that that will carry the day in the long run, either through initiatives or just through good government um, uh, uh, sort of arguments that are made or their success in California and Arizona in, in, in that realm, he might think, OK, the courts can stay out of it because it may take several decades, but that will become the norm. We'll take it out of the hands of politicians altogether, at least in many of the states, if not most of them. This is complete conjecture and speculation, but I just wonder whether Paul's last case actually might have an impact on the way the court decides this one. OK, so it was a victory then? Uh, no, it was um, a victory yeah, for okay. one of your clients there and a go. defeat for another. And, and, and the only thing I would <laughs> add to that, though, is I, I guess what I would say, though, is you know, I, I think Marty Reitz is an excellent point, which is, you know, in some political question cases where you have a strong textual commitment to another branch, the court isn't necessarily saying, you know, Katie bar the door on this. They're saying, look, you know, you know, the other branch of government has a responsibility to enforce the constitutional norm. And there is a sense in this context in which, you know, it's a little hard, you know, you know, if the court says it's non-justiciable, then it's almost saying, it's coming pretty close to saying that there's not a constitutional problem. And at least, at least as a practical matter, that's right. what they're saying. And, but, but I guess another you know, observation that I think that follows from that is I think that perfectly explains this vote in Vieth, which is, you know, all right, we're not going to get involved in this because you know, we don't have judicially administrable standards, but you shouldn't view this as a complete green light. Because if some legislature out there behaves like a total pig, you know, I, I, might, I might be kind of willing to sort of do something about it. And I, I guess I just wonder, though, I, I mean, I guess, you know, what, what you suggested is one change that may make him even more comfortable with that resolution. I, I'm not sure I see the change that's going to make him, 
sort of less comfortable with that solution. I mean, which is to say, I think, you know, you know, maybe that's kind of where he is on this issue, which is we shouldn't say it's definitively non-justiciable, but we also shouldn't affirm the two-judge district court here. Um, we should just sort of keep this kind of sort of Damocles that I might get back involved in this hanging, and, and that's sort of the best that we can do. Yeah, I think that's the question, you know, is that the way he reacts, or are we at a point where he says, well, you know, it's just gone too far. We have too many of these situations where it's 50-50 states with three-to-one legislatures, and that's a problem that absent this initiative and referendum problem, uh, process can't correct itself, and uh, and that strategy doesn't work. And I, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's, I agree there's significant impediments to Justice Kennedy making the decision to actually intervene here, but I do think it'll come down to that sense of whether things have just gone too far such that the sword of Damocles isn't having its intended effect. And, and you know, just to add to that, the, the, the two other factors that seem to me could weigh on him. Um, one is that it's just gotten so much easier um, over time to practice political gerrymandering to a precise degree that you no longer have uh, I think they used to call them dummy manders, which is, you know, people would set things up in a way that they thought would work and then it would explode once there was uh, any shifting in Democrats to Republicans or Republicans to Democrats. And now um, the science is there to try to, to, to make this last for the decade. Um, and the second is this is his last chance. Um, you know, for those of you who think, as I do, that um, this is his last term. Um, this is his last chance. It's his last gerrymandering case, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, questions? Yeah. Well, that was partly what I was going to ask, is whether the court had to take this case and uh, whether it took it to find the word out that won't make the outstanding or Yeah, and, you know, I mean, just on, on both points, you know, I sort of feel like this is a case that they absolutely had to take. I mean, so, I, you know, I'm not sure we can read anything, you know, I mean, you know, they, they basically said, four of them had said, we don't think these things are justiciable. One of them had said, um, you know, maybe, but I haven't seen the test yet. You know, a two-judge court, so you're on appellate review, not even certiorari review, says, ah, we found it. You know, here it is. Here's the holy grail. I mean, there's just, uh, to me, there's no way they couldn't, you know, they, they could have avoided that case. So I don't think this is a situation where you can read too much into the fact that they kind of took it. Um, you know, I, there certainly are some off ramps, as there are in every case. But, no, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure they're as obvious as they are in some other cases, because, you know, you could, you could go off on standing, but... You know, if, if, if you say you got to bring partisan gerrymandering cases on a district by district basis, you really are kind of cutting back on at least the claims that have been brought to date. Um, and then as to your point, yeah, you know, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's different ways to do it than the sort of efficiency gap. Um, but, you know, even what you've just said, you know, is at least partially a product of political geography, which is to say, you know, you, you know, People start with the no you'd like to start with the notion that it should be 50-50, but there's two problems with that. One is that sort of builds in a notion of proportional representation, which the court has never been super comfortable with. But then the second problem is that's actually not right as a matter of political geography, because you know if you know if you're going to do any, have any respect for the you know sort of county lines and precinct lines and voters of one party are more concentrated than the other, then you're going to get some skew from 50-50 just based on that. And I guess, you know, the only other observation I'll make, and this is the one you should probably take with the greatest grain of salt given my involvement in the case, but, but you know, 
if, if, if I put myself in the perspective of the plaintiffs in this case, um, I'm, you know, I, I wonder whether this was the right state and the right map to sort of bring up to the Supreme Court. Because, you know, Irv's point about sort of, you know, the technology getting more and more sophisticated, I mean, there's something to that. And if that was used to produce a map that looked like, you know, 72 squash salamanders and things like, I mean, you know, then maybe, you know, you could sort of have something that really sort of ties all that together. You know, my own view is, you know, this in, 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 the, in the context of sort of political maps drawn across the country, I don't look at this one and just say, wow, I mean, that was, that was some real work they did to sort of, you know, you know, six land crossings to get, you know, and oh, you know, there's, you know, never mind that there's a, a lake there and a river there. I mean, it just, you know, it, and part of that is, you know, this, this is a map that complies as well with the state constitutional provisions. And in Wisconsin, you know, you sort of have to draw your sort of, you know, assembly districts out of Senate districts. You have to have, you know, a fair amount of respect for county lines and things like that. So it just doesn't lend itself to a kind of, you know, sort of Gamillion against Lightfoot, like, okay, that's ridiculous. Now let me figure out why it's unconstitutional. Um, it, you know, it, so, I, so I think that's, you know, part of what's going to be going on here too. So I don't know, it, you know, I, I just don't, but, I, but to answer your question most directly, I don't think this is a case where you can look at the, you know, the grant or even the fact that they grant put a stay in place and read too much into that. So, I mean, I think it, to the extent that you see um, Justice Kennedy being reluctant uh, to leave a mess behind, I agree with you. He will be reluctant to leave a mess behind, and then the question will be, is he leaving a mess behind? And if he's leaving somewhat of a mess behind, is that overridden by the need to do something about this problem? And I do think the fact that they got um, some Republicans um, in Mika's briefs behind uh, doing something will give him slightly more comfort. I don't think it's in to do something. Now, I don't think it's enough. All the rest has to fall into place. And in particular, one of these measures um, has to strike him as right in capturing the First Amendment, and I, I agree with Paul, I, I think it's the First Amendment problem he sees in excessive reliance on partisan considerations. And unless one of these tests that the plaintiffs have come up with strikes him as actually capturing what this is all about, I don't think he'll be moved by anything else. Um, and if he's in this uncertain about it, uh, then I think that's going to argue in favor of what he did in Veet, which is to say, I don't see anything here that I can sign on to, but I'm not ready to give up yet. And you'll then have four justices who say, time to give up, four justices who sign on to some version of uh, what the plaintiffs are proposing, and then the what I, I quite agree with Paul about what Justice Kennedy was doing, it's an interim effect on legislatures to say, look, if you go crazy and do something completely crazy, then you know I would step in, and that could be his parting shot. Others who want to respond? Yeah. A very brief question. 
in this case, that this that Chuck is not such a I think he's not in play and others can speak for themselves. <laughs> I would never suggest any justice isn't in play. Um, so just with that caveat, I'll, I'll leave it. But how much are you worried about him, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and to be slightly more serious, you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's the question of, you know, whether he's in play, like, you know, as a completely independent variable. And then there's the question of whether it seemed like Justice Kennedy was in play for something, whether he would write a 6-3 opinion that he wrote as opposed to allow there to be a 5-4 opinion that he was in the dissent. So, I mean, that, you know, that's another potential dynamic here. Absolutely. Other questions? Yeah. I'll just go with the yeses on the latter questions. It's not going to happen until the uh, this is decided. Well, I think it's I think it's more than just an off ramp because you know if you have a standing rule that takes out the lion's share of the partisan gerrymandering claims that have been brought to date. That's more than just some sort of technical ruling. But that would leave the possibility of the Maryland case. And, you know, and, 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 and maybe it's just because I'm not involved in the Maryland case. But, I mean, you know, I, I do think, to me, that's a little more of the model of the kind of case that might push somebody kind of over the over the edge just you know because you know and, and again I'm you know I've, I've you know I've read your article on it and a couple of other things so I'm not steeped in it but it's you know that that's one where you get people in the district or just outside the district I forget which who are hacked off and you got something that you know looks pretty abnormal so you know you, you sort of have more of the makings I think and you know and there is this weirdness of you know the statewide challenges um, kind of you know, since since the unit of analysis is statewide, they are a little less focused on the weirdness of the lines. You know, it's the net effect of all the lines and how that favors the party in power that matters, as opposed to the fact that they produced a map that looks like, you know, just, you know, it's the, the kind of like a Rorschach test or something. And, you know, I, you know, I just, I do think there is a connection between the increase of the technology, some of the things that might sort of, you know, bother, you know, a justice and some of the things that might even map on to sort of a First Amendment theory that, you know, that, 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 that where, you know, maybe the statewide, even, even if it's not a standing problem, maybe the statewide challenge isn't necessarily, uh, you know, the way to win these cases in the long run. Why don't we move on to um, Canon and uh, cell phones? All right, so I think we have 11 minutes for four cases, so I will be very quick about this. Yeah, I so, think we can stay over a little, hopefully. Stay as long as you want. Actually, I think, I think this is the most consequential case that's currently on the court's docket, but I think it also has the virtue of being pretty easy to summarize. This is a case concerning the constitutionality of the government's obtaining without a warrant so-called historic cell site location information from a, a, a mobile service provider. The petitioner is an individual by the name of Timothy Carpenter. He was suspected of involvement in a series of robberies of Radio Shacks back when we had Radio Shacks. And uh, the government um, proceeded to- and money to steal. <laughs> and the government proceeded to- And, and T-Mobile stores. That's and, actually relevant to the and, story. And T-Mobile stores as well, and that is uh, relevant. Um, <laughs> he, uh, the government proceeded to obtain from two cell service providers um, under a statute known as the Stored Communications Act, um, which does not require a showing of probable cause, um, information about Mr. Carpenter's whereabouts. The government ultimately obtained uh, approximately 100 
data points per day from approximately a four-month period uh, about Mr. Carpenter's location. And on the basis of that information, they were able to obtain convictions for, I think, six armed robberies of these Radio Shack and T-Mobile stores. And thanks to uh, the joys of consecutive sentencing in the federal system, Mr. Carpenter was sentenced to 116 years in federal custody. Uh, he brought a, a Fourth Amendment challenge, and the Sixth Circuit rejected that challenge. So the issue before the Supreme Court is yet another in the series of cases that the Supreme Court has been hearing about the application of the Fourth Amendment to emerging technologies. There are basically three primary issues in the case. Um, the first is the question of whether there is an expectation of privacy in this cell site location information. We only have the petitioner's brief on the merits, so my presentation might be inherently one-sided, but petitioner's argument is that, uh, that if anything, this is even uh, potentially more detailed information than GPS data. Uh, it may not be now, but it certainly could be in the future. Um, and this is precisely the sort of location information in which individuals have indeed traditionally had an expectation of, uh, of privacy. Uh, the argument on the other side is that, that that's uh, 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 not the case. And indeed, what you're really dealing with here are business records that are produced essentially by uh, the cell phone providers and that many consumers don't even realize exists. I think the second question, and the one that will probably get the most attention, is whether the fact that this information is in the hands of a third party somehow takes it outside the scope of the Fourth Amendment. And in a pair of cases, most notably in Smith versus Maryland, a case that involved um, a telephone dialing information, the Supreme Court said, if you're talking about information in the hands of a third party, that's categorically outside the uh, purview of the Fourth Amendment. The petitioner argues that a different analysis should apply in the digital age by virtue of the, the pervasive information that is now held not only by mobile uh, service providers but by uh, uh, other private parties. The third issue, and, and potentially the issue where the rubber is really going to meet the road, is whether if there is a search here, that search is in fact reasonable. Um, petitioner suggests that the court need not reach that issue, which to me is a little bit of a yellow flag that petitioner has real concern that they're going to lose on that issue if uh, the court reaches it. Petitioner's argument is that uh, you've got to apply the traditional uh, uh, Fourth Amendment framework. Typically, we, we require a warrant or probable, and or probable cause, and the government had neither of those things here. The problem for petitioner, I think, is that there is this federal statute, the Stored Communications Act, which was uh, enacted in 1986, certainly before the advent of modern uh, mobile technology, but that requires the government only to make a showing um, that there are specific and articulable facts showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the records being sought from a covered communications provider are relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation. And the government's argument in response, which I think was foreshadowed in the government's brief at the certiorari stage, is that that statute essentially changes the analysis. It reflects a congressional judgment that all that is required here is, again, reasonable grounds for belief. And the government further argues that, if anything, the Stored Communications Act provides more protection than you would have in the traditional subpoena context, where there isn't even a, 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 an additional showing of specific and articulable facts, and that the appropriate lens of analysis here is the standard that applies uh, in the subpoena context where the government is obtaining records from a third party. And so I think that that's the issue on which petitioner may actually have the greatest challenge, whether or not the Supreme Court will reach that issue is anyone's guess. So uh, anybody else want to add thoughts on this? If not, why don't we turn to the press? Any questions from the press? On this one, I guess I would just I, I would add to con I confirm Cannon's sense that there's a very real possibility that the court holds that this is a search, which I think will be seen as a victory, not necessarily for this case, but for other emerging issues. But that the standards of the Stored Communications Act satisfy the Fourth Amendment. At least some justices, maybe Justice Alito, will be very enamored with that solution. And it will sort of tee. And the reason might be it'll be interesting to see how the United States treats the grand jury subpoena issue that's lurking out there because this provides the, the, the defendant more protection than a grand jury subpoena would and traditionally the court has allowed an extraordinarily wide berth to the government when it comes to grand jury subpoenas. 
And I wonder whether that's an issue the court wants to revisit, almost certainly not in this case. It'll be interesting to see whether the government really presses hard on the grand jury subpoena analogy or whether you know, it cuts both ways, because you could also say to the government, why do you need this if you can get it through a grand jury subpoena? Um, so that's something to watch for. But I think a um, something for both sides result is a very real possibility. So let's move on to the, uh, our, do we get to bet on NCAA games case? This What's is, the answer to that? This is Christie oh, versus the um, NCAA. Um, Gibson Dunn is counsel for Governor Christie in the case, and Paul is representing um, the sports league. So I'm sure Paul will have some input on um, this case as well. It's also going to be among the most high-profile cases of the term, but probably the only one that's ever mentioned on Sports Center. Um, mm -hmm. I don't watch Sports Center myself, but some of the associates I work with tell me that it's essential to their lives. Um, the question presented is, as Irv suggested, whether the Tenth Amendment <laughs> allows Congress to prohibit states from repealing existing prohibitions on sports betting. We call it sports betting, Irv. Not Paul sports gambling. calls it sports, sports gambling. Gam oh, I, I didn't mean to take Paul's side inadvertently. <laughs> the important it's okay. <laughs> linguistic nuance uh, in the briefs. But we think, I think, Christy has all the makings of a great case, particularly from the point of view of the press. It's got a colorful and a famous governor, racehorses, bookies, the National Football League, and the anti-commandeering doctrine. What's not to love. <laughs> For those of us on the panel who were of the vintage to have clerked during the late Chief Justice Rehnquist's tenure, you may recall sitting around and singing show tunes with the chief. And this case reminds me of Guys and Dolls and the classic song, I've Got a Horse Right Here. You can just see the bunch of swells from New York and New Jersey, nice and nicely, Benny and Rusty Charlie, or here, Chris Christie, Roger Goodell, and the Speaker of the New Jersey House hanging out at the racetrack with their cigars, trying to figure out which horse can do. So which is the winning horse here? Well, and pardon all the puns, but Irv suggested it would be good to be funny, at least toward the end, <laughs> to try to be. Uh, but it's been 20 years since the Supreme Court has invalidated a federal statute under the anti-commandeering doctrine. And if I were a betting person, and in fact, a wagering person. I'm not, um, I'd put my money on the proposition that the court is about to strike down a statute under that doctrine again. The statute at issue, of course, is the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, or PASPA. And whenever Congress uses the word prote protection in the name of a federal statute, you should probably reach for your wallet. <laughs> the statute forbids a state to sponsor, operate, advertise, promote, license, or authorize by law sports betting. It also bars individuals from operating a sports betting enterprise pursuant to state law. PASPA exempted Nevada and a couple of other states um, to allow them to continue sports lotteries at the time, and it actually gave New Jersey the option to authorize sports betting in Atlantic City if it did so within a year, but New Jersey didn't um, pursue that course. What New Jersey did do was in 2011 to have a constitutional referendum, and the voters voted to amend the state constitution to allow sports wagering. So a year later, the state legislature repealed the ban on sports betting and authorized its agencies to license and regulate the activity. The NCAA, as well as all four of the major professional sports leagues, quickly filed suit. They argued that New Jersey's actions violated PASPA, and New Jersey argued that PASPA violates the anti-commandeering principle. The Third Circuit initially held that PASPA just prohibits states from affirmatively authorizing sports wagering, thus narrowing the statute, upholding its constitutionality, and striking down New Jersey's <coughs> action. So what does New Jersey do? They took the Third Circuit at its word and passed a new law that merely repealed its earlier ban, but only as applied to casinos and racetracks. So Paul ran back into court, sued again, and the Third Circuit again struck down New Jersey's effort. The Third Circuit said that by selectively repealing the prohibition on sports gaming, New Jersey had actually authorized sports gaming, 
and therefore violated PASPA. But to reach that conclusion, the court had to reject its prior statement that PASPA only prohibited affirmative action. The Supreme Court then granted cert on the question whether the anti-commandeering doctrine only prevents the federal government from requiring states to do things, or if it also prevents the federal government from prohibiting states from repealing or modifying state laws. And the court, of course, granted cert despite the absence of a split and over the opposition of the United States, so one would think that the odds might at this point favor the petitioners. So New Jersey's argument in this court is a lot like what it was below, at least in the first round, which is that Congress can't tell the states what it has to do with respect to its legislation, even if Congress would have the power to take that action to prohibit certain conduct uh, on its own. If Congress wants to outlaw sports wagering pursuant to its powers under the Interstate Commerce Clause, it should take the political heat and do that directly. One interesting historical tidbit in the briefs is that New Jersey is now benefiting in this case from the framers' rejection of the so-called New Jersey plan at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The Virginia plan, as I'm sure you all know, prevailed, which forbade the federal government from acting directly upon the states, but only upon the citizens of the states. So back in 1787, I guess New Jersey did not take the adequately long view and understand that at some point in time, they would like to have more sovereign authority over important matters like sports betting. But back to 2017. The sports leagues in return say that PASPA is just a preemption statute. It's not uh, subject to the commandeering, anti-commandeering doctrine at all. It just prohibits contrary state action, and we've got lots of preemption statutes out there. So is this case a commandeering case, or is it a preemption case? I think the court will say it's a commandeering case. And I think the reason they will say that is because this, I don't think they're going to buy the affirmative negative command distinction, that there's a difference between affirmatively requiring a state to do something and banning a state from repealing or modifying existing laws. At the end of the day, the state's being forced to regulate conduct that its voters and the state legislature would prefer to leave unregulated or to regulate in a different way. And you can think of a lot of examples of situations where Congress could enforce a social policy without taking action itself. For instance, it could tell the states, you cannot repeal any existing prohibitions on the use of marijuana instead of passing an anti-drug law itself. Um, so in terms of counting the noses, I find it interesting, or I found it interesting, to see that Justice Kennedy had joined the majorities in the two prior anti-commandeering cases, New York and Prince. So when you add that together with uh, Justice Gorsuch and some of the others, I think what we might see here is kind of a resurgence of the late Chief Justice Rehnquist's federalism uh, principles that marked, marked his court. There are some remedial questions that I think are interesting issues to keep your eyes on. What will the court do with the ban on individual operation of sports wagering enterprises, even if it says that um, the ban on state licensing or authorization violates the 10th Amendment? Um, I, I'll spare you the gory details of the legal arguments on there, but there is a possibility that New Jersey will win with respect to the state action part of the statute but that the ban on individual operation will remain, will remain in effect. And so the thoroughbred association and the casino owners in New Jersey actually won't be able to lawfully operate their business. So it could be a win for the 10th Amendment, but a loss on the practical side, depending on what happens with the remedies. Paul, I'm, do you want to uh, weigh in? Yeah, I, I can't resist adding just a couple of notes here. Um, you know, one is, you know, it's always tempting, and you know, we talked about this in the context of, of, of the Gill case, you know, to read a lot into a cert grant. I mean, you know, I do think the two, two things that are worth keeping in mind. One is that, you know, when this case went up there the first time around, uh, the court denied cert. Um, so in Christie 1, the court denied cert. Only in Christie 2 did they grant cert. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, I, I, it doesn't seem like the court was dying to get into this case in the first instance. Um, the other thing that's worth keeping in mind is that the Third Circuit granted en banc in this case after the sports leagues had prevailed. And of course, at the point that uh, the Third Circuit granted en banc and, you know, and, and vacated the sports league's victory, a lot of people thought, well, they're going to come out the other way. And ultimately, they ruled nine to three in favor of the sports leagues and the constitutionality of PASPA. And I think, you know, that reflects that however the court decides this case, you know, figuring out what's commandeering and what's just preemption is pretty darn difficult. And it's actually worth, you know, if you're so inclined to take a look at the Prince decision that Justice Scalia wrote, because there's a lot of language in there where he talks about trying to narrowly distinguish uh, the anti-commandeering doctrine being applied for the second time ever in Prince and ordinary principles of preemption. And he kind of, you know, the, you know, it's easy to pick some rhetoric out of the Prince decision or the New York against the United States decision that sort of says, you know, the, the Congress can't tell states how to legislate. But, you know, Congress sort of does that all the time. I mean, you know, Congress passes laws that says that states can't legislate on certain topics. They pass laws that say you can only legislate on certain topics if you legislate in certain ways. You know, no state can have a law authorizing the regulation of, you know, transportation rates for trucks or rates for airlines because Congress has preempted all of that. So, the, you know, the line here is kind of not that easy to police. And this just doesn't, you know, if you look at this, this just doesn't look like commandeering, certainly not in the Prince case. I mean, you know, Prince, they're telling, uh, you know, federal law mandates that state officials do certain things um, to essentially implement the federal program. Um, you don't have commandeering in that sense here. And, you know, you, and, you, and the other thing that's sort of worth keeping in mind here is that, you know, Congress passed this statute in the first instance because it was concerned with particular state action, namely states authorizing state-run lotteries that involve sports gambling. So, you know, when you look at all those different words, you know, sponsoring, authorizing, advertising, you know, it all makes a lot of sense in terms of saying, all right, you know, we don't like this trend of there being more and more sports lotteries that states are offering, and we want to kind of, you know, stop this where, where it's gone and no further. It sure isn't written, and I'm not saying the court can't get there. Of course they can. But it's not written as a statute that really says, you know, the states, you know, it's, I mean, as Helge describes it, the states have to maintain their existing prohibitions on the books. I mean, that is not the way the statute is written. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, this is a funny case from a federalism standpoint because, you know, Congress, when it's acting, the, you, know, you know, the state of New Jersey has to concede that if the federal government wanted to, it could have passed a more comprehensive statute that said it is unlawful to engage in sports gambling, it is punishable by two years, or if it's in it, there's an aiding and abetting violation, and that's one year, and et cetera. I mean, it could, have, it could have regulated it for everywhere in the country, or it could have exempted Nevada, um, but it could have done that at the federal level. And instead, it looks around, and at the point that it's legislating, 49 states already prohibit sports gambling. Um, and each of them prohibits it in their own way. They have their own penalties. They have their own ways of prosecuting or not. And it's, it's a funny federalism argument that says that you know, Congress can get in and regulate directly, set a national sort of standard for what the punishment's going to be, and essentially displace, if they want to, all state law to the contrary. But somehow there's a commandeering problem if what they say instead is, look, we just don't want any states to authorize this stuff. And as far as like keeping your existing uh, things in the books, go, go ahead, regulate it however you want. And you know, the one thing you can't do is authorize it. And you know, we can have a, a healthy debate about whether a repeal of a prohibition only at casinos and racetracks, only for people 21 and over, and only if you don't engage in betting on New Jersey uh, uh, college sports teams, 
is a, a, a repeal or a de facto authorization. I kind of like my chances uh, on that particular piece of the case. So I, I'm, I'm going to allow a rebuttal if you want to have one. Uh, <laughs> come to the argument. You'll hear it all. <laughs> uh, anything from the press? Yeah. If New Jersey wins uh, on the broader grounds, then it means that other states can repeal existing bans on sports gaming and in the broader sense that other states can repeal um, uh, that, well, I'll just limit it to sports gaming, I think. I think the argument is that if New Jersey doesn't win, if we lose, then Congress will be able to force a bunch of states to basically implement federal policy without passing a federal law directly regulating the topic itself. But it would leave other states free to modify or loosen any existing bans on sports gaming. And Pete, I was going to say that you know, if, if New Jersey wins, do you remember in A Wonderful Life, when our hero has oh you know, has, guys and dolls versus it's a one yeah life. you know when when when, <laughs> when our hero has in fact not 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 been there to you know help save the day and the and the and the main street is covered with you know gambling parlors right, you know, right. dance halls and right. all sorts of you know, that's what'll happen. <laughs> Paul's the good angel, I think. Then, and then. Um, do we have other good. questions? So we've reached the. Um, time for closure um, and so I want to let the panelists who've dedicated their time here to to go if they choose and the press who uh, wants to leave to leave and um, if anybody if there's a any, a critical mass still here I'll be happy to uh, do the last two cases and if not tell them you know, what you were going to talk I, about. I was going to talk about the um, uh, NLRB cases on uh, arbitration agreements and uh, corporate liability for human rights violations. So, um, Can I ask one quick question though? I bet all the press will be interested in knowing the answer to this. And that's whether the members of the panelists agree with Berg that this is just a change left um, on the court. And if you do agree with them, what specifically could you tell us that this is uh, I think everyone's being far too quick to assume that. I, I just, I'm not sure he's decided, and I think we should not presume anything. I have no inside information. I just don't see the case other than this, this little tidbit about what he might have told some clerkship applicant. Um, you know, I, th I think he's looking to see what happens with Trump appointees and, and his own life. I don't know what his, his family situation is and his health and... I, j I just think we shouldn't assume anything. Hey, yes, the rest of you. Hey, don't go, you I've got to run. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, can you keep Cannon here? Is it that interesting? Nobody else wants to have weigh in? Oh, I, I agree with Marty. I agree with Marty. I think Ur's probably right. <laughs> it's two to two. Cannon. <laughs> well, Paul. I, I would I will say I I, I love Irv um, and I think he's very very wise but I was a little surprised how definitively he put that. Yeah, D Don was too at the uh, remember at Stanford. Yeah, yeah, I was. You were shocked that I said it at Stanford. So, you know, we do. I don't think we have any more information than you do. That's why I'm. Does Irv? My my. My experience is Irv always has more information than I. Other questions to you? Yeah. Would, would one of you characterize for us the term? I'm here to relax, sir. Don't say it like <laughs> So I would just like to ask who can remember the, bet, the most important case from last term? Because I can't. Right. Um, I read something that said there's more blockbuster cases set for argument that was in Adam. October of this term than there was for the entire hey, Adam wants us to quote himself term. back. Yeah. There are more blockbuster cases set for argument in October of this term than there were during the entire 2016 oh, term. Yeah. And what, and what, what <laughs> I would say, Adam, is that this is my kind of term. Um, 
I think he's going to be a very timid, quiet justice. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's demonstrated that he is, so far anyway, not at all reluctant to take idiosyncratic views and to articulate them in big cases and in small. He issued more separate opinions in one week, I believe, than Justice Kagan did, she being the most recent just, justice before him, in three or more years. Um, and he did so even when it meant opposing the chief and what the chief was doing. Um, he is not shy about stating his views. Now, Justice Stevens, although the tone was very different, Justice Stevens early in his career also um, was very reluctant to join any opinion. He didn't agree with everything, you know, everything in the opinion would write separately all the time with sometimes very interesting idiosyncratic separate views. Uh, over time, of course, especially when he became the leader of one faction of the court, he changed to become much more strategic and to understand the value of the court speaking with, with one voice. Whether that will characterize Justice Gorsuch and if so, how long that will take I, is anybody's guess. And but, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Helgi, please. Okay, I'm sure everybody's noticed there's definitely a budding bromance between Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch, and I would expect to see that continue, more joining of each other's opinions on important issues. I mean, as you all know, Justices Alito and Thomas, in the last three or four terms, wrote separately, you know, I think it just in record numbers in terms of dozens and dozens and dozens of cases more than the other justices. And I think what we've seen so far is that Justice Gorsuch might join them and become, you know, the three of them might write separately a great deal. The real interesting question is how often they will secure two other votes to become a majority. And I think that just depends on the docket and on a lot of different variables. All right, thank you, everyone.